Welcome to Module 6 of Week 7 for ED1421. This week we are continuing our exploration of text analysis by exploring further the social and cultural dimensions of text as crafted objects, meaning that no texts are neutral or are representations of the way things are. They are all, indeed, social constructions, created by someone with a purpose, no matter how apparently simple or harmless. Therefore, that is why this week's module is called Text and Discourse Analysis. In this week's course materials, you will learn further about the importance of teachers having the awareness of how texts are constructed and the influence these constructions have on the reader. And it is with this awareness that teachers, or you, yourself, will be able to introduce to your students a critical awareness of the values and power relations that are embodied in any text. So without further ado, let's go. By the end of this module, you'll all, you will be able to apply your understanding of the four literacy practices, understand the role of text in positioning readers, listeners and viewers, understand language selection as serving purposeful intent. In other words, language is deliberately selected for an intended purpose. You'll also understand the construction of literacy or literacies and the importance of this concept. And lastly, you analyse how people are differently constructed by and within texts. So at this stage of your learning, we now know that discourses shape how we see the world. What we are beginning to become familiar with is the role of advertising in shaping our perceptions of the world and our role within it. In fact, advertising plays a really significant role in the shaping of discourses that you belong to or that you identify with. From advertising food and products to real estate and vehicles, the discourses in these advertisements influence your choices um, on these products or whatever the advertisers are trying to persuade you to buy, but also they influence how you see the world. Indeed, advertisements, which basically are a crafted text, use word, words, images, colour and other meaningful aspects to influence the intended audience and whoever is viewing or listening. What is worth thinking about as you progress through this module is how many discourses are you shaped by, particularly by advertisements. So according to Emmett, Sabaki, Komisarov and Pollock, language, ideology and power can be summarised as follows. Language is not neutral or value free. And I think this is something that has been emphasised a lot and hopefully is something that you're beginning to get a really good understanding of. So ideologies operate in everyday society. We know that so far and that ideologies often compete with each other, meaning that there are values and beliefs that are often that literally are in opposition, opposition to each other and exist simultaneously within the same group and same society. These, these authors also assert that viewpoints can be seen as natural over time due to their constant use. They become normalised to the point where they're no longer questioned. They're just see, seen as the way things are. There, therefore, it is through language within a discourse that we see reality or our worldview. However, with this in mind, language can also manipulate us without us even knowing or being aware of it and sometimes um, having quite negative consequences as well as positive. So to continue with language and power for a moment, we know that language is derived from context, so the situation that the language is in. What this means is that language users take on roles and adopt certain styles of language appropriate to the role within a particular situation. Whether it is seeing a doctor or speaking with a friend, you are required to use a certain type of language because it's dependent on the context. And this means that language needs to be analysed by examining the context. So, how do you examine the context? Well, firstly, you'll need to look at the register. What the register means is understanding the language choice that the user is using is dependent on the situation. So that's basically the register. Then there is tenor, which, which means that the language choice is contingent on the relationship of the author or speaker with the reader and listen, listener. So it's basically the relationship between the two. And lastly, there is mode, the form of communication, such as is a text spoken, written, graphic, or a combination of these. So it's basically uh, a little bit like the genre, the format. With all these factors in mind, we can see that any text producer can and will position their target audience to take on a particular position. And 
what a text producer is aiming to do is they're always targeting their ideal reader, viewer or listener. And that's basically their purpose. So we now know that our positioning is not determined. So we, how we position is definitely not determined. Like we, we, uh, we have some control on how we see the world. However, having said this, the way we are positioned tends to conform to appropriate institution, institutionalized behaviors and values and are cult culturally determined or constructed due to the fact that how you see the world is so shaped by the culture and the institutions within that culture that it, it is very difficult to see the world in a different way because of the, that culture and those institutions shapes so much of how you actually see the world. So it's, um, as you can see, uh, your social environment will shape largely your interpretation. Then advertisers are aware of this and will use things like stereotypes to their advantage. So by positioning the viewer to occupy a particular role or behavior, such as what it is to be a real man or a beautiful woman within modern society. Well, to illustrate this concept, I have pasted two images of two popular magazines that I found. When I was searching uh, for magazine covers that had images of males and females, what I found is that the, these two images that I have on the screen in front of you tended to represent the norm of what I was seeing across the board. Women were generally very youthful and often doing a seductive pose, uh, much more so than Kate Upton within this particular image. Um, I chose this one because it's actually not as provocative as those many, many of the images were. Uh, but as you can see, the text or the words uh, on this magazine cover uh, tend to confirm what the, the producer of the text is trying to convey about um, this, this female. Whereas males tended to be generally across the board, uh, usually represented with a stubble or what, what is known as a three day beard and look quite serious or um, composed, you know, with a little, little bit of a smile. And this tended to be across the board as well uh, and only differed in sport magazines where males would have a, um, their shirt off. But you would not see them in any case actually doing a sexual pose in front of to the audience. So that was a difference. Uh, what these images in, intend to do is to encourage you to ask how do these images position you to see the role of men and women? I also understand that by including these images, I, as your teacher, um, am also perpetuating a stereotype of providing them as examples of what is deemed to be an you know, attractive woman and attractive man within modern society. Nevertheless, they do portray ways of being in the world for their viewers. And I think you can agree there that they send a message to individuals of all ages of what it is to be female and what it is to be male, just, you know, um, on magazine covers, which is a good example. So to encourage our students to see how they are being positioned by these texts, such as the advertisements that I've just um, presented to you, it is essential to teach the skills known as critical literacy. Critical literacy can be defined as the ability to interrogate texts for, so being able to analyze and critique texts, uh, examine the ide ideologies at work within the text, the power relations at play, and how the reader is being positioned. In other words, um, how they are being uh, manipulated by the producer of the text to see the world. And also who is included and excluded within the text, whose opinions are silenced, who's being marginalized, all those factors. Therefore, in your teaching practice, the following questions are a good guide to encouraging the development of critical literacy skills in your students. You can ask your students the following questions when they analyze a text. Who is doing what to whom? Whose interests is a text serving? And how is a reader, listener, viewer being positioned? There are many more questions than this that, you can, that can also be asked and they will no, no doubt need to be modified according to the year level of the children in your classroom. So critical literacy, dramatically varies depending on the questions, 
year level and the, what, what you're trying to uh, encourage the students to be able to do. Now, to summarise Module 6, we now know that the texts are not, the texts are not neutral. They are socially constructed. We know that creators of texts have choices in selecting text forms, content, language, and certain views to shape reader, listener, viewer perception. Critical literacy is a valuable skill for students to learn and how to analyze and critique a text on how the texts are positioning the audience to see the world. We also know that advertisers use stereotypes to promote a particular message, but also to help sell or promote their product. Your role as a teacher is to enable your students to be able to navigate the meaning of this vast array of texts that they will be exposed to throughout their lives. So before I go, I've decided to add to this module some of my thoughts on the discussion board posts and interaction in the forums, particularly as we are just past the halfway point in this subject. Firstly, I'd like to tell you that I'm really impressed by most of your contributions, particularly when you relate what you've been learning to the real world to your real world experiences. This is great and something that I strongly encourage. I'm also impressed by your attempts to define what you are learning in your own words as you're making some sense of some very abstract concepts. This is indeed wonderful and something that I believe really uh, cements the learning uh, for your peers, but also for me as well. What I would like to see a lot more of is actual responding to your peers' contributions. So what I mean is actually taking what your peer has said in a previous post and relating it to your own post. In this way, what you add is like a continuity of your peers' ideas. It's kind of like an essay where you have the continuity of ideas between paragraphs and so that, so that the reader of your essay or your discussion board post is understanding that you're not only adding your own input, but you're also responding to people that have previously spoken before you. So what I'm trying to say is, for example, if your fellow student teacher has posted some examples of, of concepts that are illustrated in, the, in their life, and you're about to post your perception of how those very same concepts are illustrated in your life, you will add yours, but you will do so in response to your peer. In this way, it becomes a lot more readable for both the next person that is going to respond and for anyone reading over the discussion. It can be very distracting, and you've no doubt experienced this yourself, to read posts that are added one after the other, but there's no connection between them. In other words, no continuity. And that really hinders learning, in my opinion, because it becomes, because of there's no flow, the individual automatically, it's like a disruption. And you'll find this um, in teaching that there needs to be continuity. And I think this is what makes a discussion board forum worthwhile and so much more engaging. So that's the reason why I've decided um, to um, add this to this week's video. Uh, please post your thoughts on this in the comment section on YouTube or directly email me. I'm curious to see what you think about this as well. So if you have any further questions, please post questions about the subject or this module in the frequently asked questions located in LearnJCU or contact me directly at, uh, via email. See the subject outline, the LibGuide, LearnJCU and Facebook for further contact details and information about this subject. Thank you for listening to Module 6, Text and Discourse Analysis. Next week I'll present a video for Module 7 called Oracy in the Early Childhood Classroom. Please subscribe and comment. Any feedback is really appreciated. Thank you. Bye for now.